there's a warning on about the weather that snow will start at three o'clock, just started. <laughs> and will increase as the evening goes on with snow all night and with snow all day tomorrow in this area. It appears that is two snowstorms are crossing the country from coast to coast. One is a light one and one is a heavy one and one follows the other. Almost like they have some consciousness of their own. <laughs> Sometimes I watch these, they have these tornadoes that go and the pathway these tornadoes take is so strange. I, we haven't had many tornadoes in India, but in once, many years ago, we had one in New Delhi. The tornado attacked so many buildings, a hospital came right in its pathway, it moved away, and then came back to the line. Just made a detour to save the hospital. So, it looks so odd. Therefore, many people in India believe that these whirlwind movements of particles are all controlled by a soul. They are also temporary living things. They also believe that souls can be disembodied from the physical body and become ghosts. And two types of ghosts. The ghosts that are born because of an accident, unnatural event, like murder, a person is murdered, the body is killed, a person is there. And the person wonders what happened, why what happened, and is angry, the mind is angry, and the mind is looking at what happened, where it happened, and get stuck at that location for a long time. And in Indian language we call them Preet. So the others who move around are called Bhut, Bhut and Preet two types of ghosts, those who remain at one local place for a long time and those who roam around all over. So the one that are stuck at one place, they are responsible for what we say haunted places. That this house is haunted. You, then you study the history, yes, a murder took place there, suicide took place there, unnatural death took place there, accident took place there. So those people believe that these disembodied spirits can see us. We cannot see them because we can only see matter. We can't see the, the energetic bodies. We can't see their sensory astral bodies. So that is why they see us and we can't see them. They want to touch us, but they don't have the tactical sense that we have with matter. Therefore, they try to hold our hand and their hand passes through. So they are very frustrated. Their life is highly frustrated because they are still attached to people, attached to things, attached to properties, and they can't get away. And we can't help them. We think, well, they're gone, they died, we don't know where they are, and they are sitting next to us. <laughs> they say, we are here, we are here, they're screaming. We can't hear them. Wish we could see them once more. They say, don't you see, we are next to you, and we can't hear them and we can't see them. So their frustration increases with everything. So that is why sometimes they say that that part of life, which is disembodied spirits at one location, is a very bad karma. And you, have to, you are paying off a very bad karma. The suffering is so much in that state. Some people say, what do you think about suicide? People are miserable in this world. They commit suicide escape. Not at all. Those who commit suicide are stuck there for how long they are stuck? For how long their body would have normally lived if they had not committed suicide? Each one of us has two types of life. A notional life which is designed according to the structure of the body, the degradation that takes place with age and when it should normally die and some things can interrupt it. Accidents can interrupt it, suicide can interrupt it, murder can interrupt it. In which case, when the body dies prematurely from its notional age, it stays stuck there or roams around there 
for the remainder period till the natural death would have occurred. So sometimes people who commit suicide young have to stuck for a long time and they don't realize how terrible it is to be still living there, can't escape from there and can't talk to anybody, can't reach those people and you're miserable. So it is not an escape from misery, it's going into a worse miserable state. So people say, is it okay to have suicide? I said, not at all. See what happens. But how can we see? I said, you can see. Like they see us, we can see them. But not with these eyes. But with the eyes of the inner body I spoke earlier. You can see those people who are dead, but not fully dead because they're still roaming around. They're dead in the physical body. I, sometimes I can see people attending these meetings who you can't see. They like the meetings, but they can't do anything. They just come out of uh, just frustration. The main thing I would say is frustration. Sometimes they get tied up for long periods here. I, I know people, uh, one person was murdered. And a friend of his was also uh, there, but he was very close friend. And, and that person, before he was murdered, had talked to me about his possible death. Because he was murdered by his own brother and sister. And he, they chased him, they tried to kill him several times. He came to me, he said, will this follow my life, that they are always trying to kill me, I have to avoid myself from my own siblings and try to run away. I said, don't run away. You killed them. Look back at your own life. Past life, you killed them mercilessly. They are going to kill you. Anyway. He said, then why postpone? I said, well, you don't have to postpone, but if you get killed before the time that you are supposed to die because you want an early escape, like you are saying, you will be there stuck till the death would have come otherwise. He said, I don't mind. So they killed him, but because of grace, his master's grace helped him to some extent, a small extent that because he used to do meditation and used to withdraw his attention, he had become a little bit of expert in pulling himself out whenever he wanted. So with the master's grace, he pulled himself few seconds before he was killed. So he stood like this and saw his body being killed which was a good experience he laughed. He felt happy in the disembodied state. And then he came and attended a program of ours, the Bandara, after that. And when he attended the Bandara, he was standing at the back. Why did he choose the place to stand at the back? Because his friend, who was the closest friend, was also standing there. And he stood next to him. And the closest friend felt him. He told me immediately, I felt he was here. I said, did you see him? Well, I thought he was there, I felt him. I didn't see him. I said, he was there with him. So I'm only mentioning to you that our forms of life are many, and this is just one form we are occupying. Even in this creation, in physical creation, we roam around in disembodied forms. So death does not mean death all the way. It only means death of the first body. You can die in the second level also. And that also finishes. But it's a long life, several thousand years life. Several thousand physical times. Physical a clock says several thousand years before the inner body dies. And the mind also dies. The causal body also born and dies. It's also a body, but several million years. So you can have one mind for several astral births and several physical births in one astral form. So what happens is that the memories 
continue to stay in the same mind and therefore you can remember in the physical body some things you can remember very little this is very coarse this dense this body in the body is finer you can remember more in the causal body you remember everything in the causal body you can see everything for millions of years <laughs> not a few thousand years you can see the creation of universes for example you can see many things in the causal body it's a very great experience big adventure so we do not really die completely we die in one cover and we still living in the inner one <clears throat> when the inner one dies a new one is born at that level then it covers more physical bodies physical bodies are not only physical human bodies you must know that the physical form consists of millions of forms according to one list 8.4 million forms of life in a physical form is there physical body physical world is there all the insects the plants the animals the birds angels gods governing our territories created uh, those creators sitting there giving responsibility to run the creation all are same souls in different forms based upon a simple law a law that is generated by our mind gets stuck with our mind never leaves our mind and become the basis of all life called the law of karma law of cause and effect law of do good you'll be rewarded do bad you'll be punished such a strong law that we keep on deciding in our head should we do it is good we get rewarded oh this i shouldn't do you're punished we are determining the law in our head affected by where we are placed where we are born which society is around us which family is raising us they all put ideas good and bad they get embedded in our mind and we live in the law of karma of cause and effect divided into good and bad divided into punishment and reward and all forms of life come from there we say we have committed very bad sins bad things evil things okay then become a plant then become a dog then become a horse then become for a certain period depending upon what you have done then come back again as human being another chance why do they say another chance because you cannot commit something and call it good or bad except in the human form there is no other form in which you can do something and say this was good this was bad now the trees and plants do nor animals do nor angels do nobody does it except a human being therefore this has been called a karam juni that means you can create karma and then bhog all the others are called bhog juni which you pay off karma can you imagine the versatility of the karma we can create the quantum of karma we can create in one human life that it can lead to several forms of life just to pay off one life's karma the reason for that is that karma is not created by action karma is created by intention and we intend to do so many things which you never do and they are all creating karma if you do it supposing you intend to kill somebody but don't kill karma is still created you have to be punished for it you knew it were not right you didn't do it karma is still created if you actually kill is the karma becomes amplified becomes worse the reward punishment level goes up for that so all the time when we are having thoughts in our head and intending to do things we are creating karma so since we are thinking and intending all the time we create in one lifetime so much karma we can sometimes take a hundred lives to pay off and it's not possible to pay off in the very next life because life in the physical form or in, in some forms the trees can last thousands of years some forms can last in the higher planes can last for millions of years you can stay there for a long time but if you come back here as a physical human being is too small a period therefore in a 100 years life you can't pay off the karma of one life you can pay 10 20% 30% what happened to the rest 
bulk of the karma you created in the last life, you can't pay off in this life. Where is it going? It is going into your mind, a reservoir, and the mind in the causal self, which we call the sanchit karma, reserve karma. If reserved, mind can pull up again and again from there to create new lives. If you had a totally karma-free life, karma-free life means where you made no decision, but drifted like a boat on a sea. Rudderless boat, no engine, you just drift. If you live a life like that, make no decisions. Whatever circumstances take you, go with it. You're creating no karma. There's plenty sitting inside your head to create several more lifetimes. Therefore, even trying to be karma-free does not let us get away from it. It's a very big trap. Very big trap. Therefore, we need some real good assistance to understand how this is a trap, to understand how we can get out of it. And all that comes to us when we are ready to get out of the trap. When we are ready to escape, perfect living master appears, tells us the way, says go within yourself. Truth is not to be found anywhere else. You can go to as many temples as you like. You can go to as many churches as you like. You can go to as many synagogues as you like. Go to any mosque you like. Go to any place of worship you like. Nothing will be there except in the only place of worship, the only place of discovery. That's your own self, your own act on your body. Go within that and you will find it. These are copies of the head. They made the original pieces of worship. Buddha, Buddha's times and even earlier in India and elsewhere, they made stupas, round domes, and they still sometimes use domes. What is a dome? A copy of the real dome. We are all wearing on our, on our bodies. That's the real dome. There used to be certain types of headdress, popular headdress with spikes coming in and very, very decorative. Churches are decorated like that. Cathedrals are dec decorated like that. They're all trying to copy the head, trying to say, this is it. That was example. We play music there, we sing songs there and not listen to the music inside and the songs going on inside us. We say prayer there, we don't listen to our own prayer going on inside us. So this was symbolic outside and we are now running after symbols and forgot what they were symbolic for. So the truth is all inside. If you are a seeker and have been lucky that your time has come to find out you'll find everything inside. Very happy to share all this with you and have a safe journey, drive safely and see if your flights are going. If not, enjoy another stay here <laughs> or whatever. Thank you very much. <laughs>